Good morning, good morning. If you'll please stand and give you the countdown there, you can see what I see. Welcome and glad that we can gather to encourage one another, be encouraged in our faith, and ultimately, most importantly, to worship our God and Savior. Um, as I, everything kind of connects, again, it's sort of an unintentional theme for me, I guess, these past few weeks. Uh, we will uh, begin with a song titled Today that, that connects to a passage that Tom used last week. As the Lord speaks to us today, don't let your heart be hardened. Um, let the Lord work by his spirit. Uh, and so we choose because of his grace, he has given us life and we can choose to follow him. Well, good morning and welcome. We're so glad uh, for all of you to be here with us uh, this morning at Crossgate and glad to have you in our uh, fellowship this morning on a day when it is, uh, it is a day of salvation, when God uh, calls us to himself and we can not only be with one another, uh, but come uh, to the Lord. So we're thankful for your presence with us. want to uh, bring just a few announcements to your uh, attention as well. You've got an insert in the bulletin on the friendship dinners. Um, and if you're watching online, you don't have the insert, but you could go online and still find out about it. Um, we're putting friendship and dinner together. Uh, it's a great time. We, we really just want to have some opportunities of, of fellowship and connection with one another uh, in the body. And so you can uh, sign up for those. They'll take place. This is a just more informal time of sharing a meal uh, together. And as you sign up, 
uh, the list will be kind of divided and, and reconfigured so you get together with a group of people maybe you don't know as well and uh, just in, in, enjoy that time with one another. So you can tear off the bottom of the insert and put it in the offering box to sign up or you can go online. But either way, we need you to go ahead and do it probably today, I think maybe the last day. If you realize tomorrow you forgot, just go ahead and send it in anyway. We'd love to, love to have everyone connect on that. But uh, just a great time of, of looking forward in that. And if you're still not sure, what is this? How does it work out? I got an easy way that you can, that you can learn all about it. Uh, j- just sign up and come, and then you'll, then you'll know. It'll be a great, great experience, though. Uh, also, I want to point out to you on the end of the announcements there is a save the date um, for a ice cream social on Sunday evening, uh, Sunday, June 13th. And not just an ice cream social, but a, a homemade ice cream uh, social. So we'll have uh, have some some churned ice cream out there. In fact, if you're if you if you would like to do some churning, you make great ice cream, or you've got one that you can just plug in. We'll be looking for for that info uh, soon. But hey, as it starts starts warming up, uh, it'll be a great time to just uh, be with one another, have some ice cream, cool down, enjoy that fellowship. Really, we had a great time at the. Uh, whole church-wide fellowship that we did um, you know, a month or so ago. We just want to, as we have the opportunity now, to have more occasions like that of, of being with one another. Uh, so I encourage you to go ahead and mark that on your calendar as well for Sunday, uh, June 13th at uh, 630, ice cream, ice cream social. And I would encourage you as well, uh, we still have just notation on there about the faith promise uh, missions giving as that's uh, continuing to come in. Uh, and we are so thankful for that and want to want to want to encourage you to take up the opportunity, if you haven't yet, to, to figure out what you would like to, to give toward that. How would you like to be uh, supporting and giving toward uh, the, this missions work? We're excited for work that others are doing uh, around the world and the ways that we can connect in uh, with them. And those uh, cards are still in the, um, in, on the tables in the foyers, or you can go online as well and, uh, and put that there. Uh, we're thankful for your, um, your engagement in God's mission around the world and for your, uh, for your giving and generosity in this. do have a, another announcement on um, uh, the Women's Book Club this summer, and Leslie Warlick's going to come, and I'll uh, tell you a little bit more about that. Okay, Leslie. Good morning. Um, the Women's Spiritual Growth Committee is um, a group of ladies that prayerfully considers biblical studies for the women to do during the year. But in the summer, we like to pick three books that you can read and discuss. They're typically monthly meetings, so you have time to read those books. And we gather over a salad supper, and we discuss them. And it's a wonderful time. So I just wanted to come before you because we're going to be starting the sign-up next week. But I wanted to give you a little heads up what the books are so that you can hear a little bit about them. The first one that we are doing in June is A Change of Affection by Beckett Cook. And then in July, we will be doing Hearts of Fire, which is a voice of the martyrs publication. And then in August, we'll be reading Becoming Mama by Evros Telfort Ismael. And they are wonderfully um, engaging books. And I just want to make sure that all women are invited. So 13 years old and up, these are books that are wonderful to read for our young ladies as well. So we really want to encourage every age to come. And if you have questions, please just talk with me. And there are many committee members um, that will be willing to talk with you. Teresa Newton is one of them. She's our leader. Uh, So feel free to just broach one of us, and we can talk to you about them. The other thing that came up after the first service was how do we get the books, if you are interested, and after you sign up next week. um, Usually we have a copy that can start circulating that's for free, but we do typically ask our ladies to buy their own copies if they want to, but that's never, um, if, you know, there's there's a concern about that or the cost of a book, please approach us because we always find ways to um, provide the books if there's a need. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Leslie. <laughs> it's like a great opportunity for, for things for the ladies to be uh, looking forward to, ways that you can uh, join in and have some great uh, discussions there around, around those topics. Uh, one other announcement I want to mention, not in the, in the um, bulletin, but just as far as community life and being excited for one another, uh, the Gwyns had their baby, Nathan and Laura Gwynn had their baby this past week, a uh, little boy, uh, James David Gwynn. So we're uh, so, so thankful for, uh, for them. Yeah. Uh, um, 
But uh, we gather this morning uh, because God uh, invites us to his presence and the call to worship. Uh, and I want to remind you that a, that a call to worship really is a, a gospel invitation. Maybe sometimes we think about the gospel invitation just, just following at the end of the service, right? But if in worship we are coming into God's presence, it's an invitation to come and meet with God that is through Christ. The call to worship invites sinners uh, to God. This, this is the gospel, the way of the gospel, that, Christ, that God has sent his son for us, uh, that our sins might be covered by what he has done so that we can be accepted in his presence, so that we can have a relationship uh, with him. So God uh, calls us uh, to himself that we would worship him, seeing who he is and what he has done. So here God's call to worship this morning from Psalm 105. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works, glory in his holy name, that the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength, Seek his presence continually. Would you pray with me as we come to worship? Well, Lord, our God, we do glory in your name, that you are holy, that you are high and lifted up, uh, that you are uh, beyond our comprehension, infinite, uh, eternal, in your wisdom and your power, in the fullness of your deity of all that your hands uh, can do, that you are our, our Father and our King, our Lord and our Savior. Lord, we thank you that we can not only glory in your name, that we can seek you, that we can come uh, to you uh, and be found uh, by you. So, Lord, we seek your presence this morning as we come uh, to worship. Uh, not just what, what our hands have done or what we could find on our own, but, Lord, you promise uh, to be with your people gathered in your name, that you have made a new and living way for us to come uh, to you and not be thrown out because of what Christ has done. Uh, that we get to be accepted, brought into your love. Well, Lord, as we worship you this morning, would, would you allow us to know your love for us and your Son? And would you allow love for you to overflow uh, from our hearts, uh, from all that you have done uh, for us? Lord, let us uh, sing and praise and tell of your uh, wondrous works and deeds. Uh, for you are our God, and we are your people. We pray in Jesus' name. So please stand. These next two songs will give you an opportunity to fulfill the call to worship, to give thanks to the Lord and to adore his name. Nothing can come. 
throne, come let us adore him, the old our King, nothing can compare, come let us
Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you and welcome those who are worshiping with us online. Today we had the privilege of hearing about a ministry uh, that Crawl State has been involved with for a number of years now. Uh, that's the ministry right across the street from us at Oconee Christian Academy. Uh, I think a lot of you know that prior to us building this facility in 2010, uh, we met at Oconee Christian Academy for a number of years, uh, and we're really blessed by them. Uh, subsequently to that, after moving over here, they asked me to be on the board, so I was on the board for seven or eight years, and, and now Joe Tappa is uh, on the board over there, and uh, will uh, be the chairman of the board in about another week. And so anyway, Joe's going to come now and just kind of share about this important ministry in the life of our church. So, Joe, come on up. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be able to come to you this morning and tell you about Oconee Christian Academy, uh, what's going on currently at the school, and how you might get involved. Uh, so before I get into any details, let me just show you uh, a quick video that shows you a little bit of the life of the students at Oconee Christian Academy. OCA exists to glorify God by nurturing our students and equipping them to fulfill God's unique purpose for their lives. Because we are a K-12 school, we have a program that's called Senior Buddies, and our seniors get to go down and visit our kindergartners. Every first Tuesday of the month, when we get to have Senior Buddies, we get to do crafts in class, learn about God. We also get to do chapel with them. We love Kelly! OCA has a strong academic program that equips us for college and our future career goals. OCA has a competitive sports program where we learn to be Christ-like on the field and on the court. Boost Team boosts the spiritual morale of the student body through Christ-centered events, chapels, and activities. We plan a boost retreat to kick off the school year, monthly chapels, and a warrior impact training day toward the end of the year. I graduated from OCA in 2012. I promise you, it will be something that you will not regret. It will be something that will be worth it, and it's something that will last for eternity. a little bit about what happens at OCA. Uh, so as uh, uh, Mrs. Edgar Crane mentioned, um, the mission statement of OCA is to uh, glorify God by nurturing our students and equipping them to fulfill God's unique purpose in their life. And OCA is committed to kingdom education. You may ask, well, what is kingdom education? And that's teaching the future generations to think and act according to a biblical worldview. So everything that we teach, it's not just Christians teaching reading, writing, and arithmetic, but it's actually the Bible integrated into every single course. I mean, I taught there for five years, and I can tell you in the logic portion of the geometry class, the entire test was Scripture. Okay, so we integrate Scripture into every single class, every single unit. So let me tell you uh, where OCA is today, kind of uh, by the numbers. Okay, the number 115. That's uh, the current enrollment at OCA. That's down about 40 students from the previous year and mostly due to the pandemic. Uh, that's roughly about a $240,000 hit to the annual budget. Two, state championships. Even in the pandemic year, we won a state championship for cross country and we just won the state cha championship for baseball with a 17-0 record. And every player on that baseball team is coming back next year. $107,000 
That's what we just raised uh, through our Warrior Challenge uh, campaign uh, for fundraising. And uh, we did a walkathon. You see kids in the walkathon there. We had a golf tournament. But mostly that is benefactors who are, are people in the community who believe in kingdom education and they're investing in that school and keeping it running every single year. One new head of school, our own Eric Johnson. Uh, so many of you may know Eric and Gwen. They live near Atlanta. But uh, now that he's going to be our head of school, they're going to move here permanently. So that's a win for OCA, and it's a win for Crossgate. And then lastly is four times a thousand, a thousand dollars. That's the new Crossgate scholarship to OCA, and that's meant for OC or for Crossgate kids, students, uh, to get a thousand dollar scholarship to go to OCA. Um, if uh, the priority is for members of OCA and then regular attendees of OCA. And then if that still doesn't fulfill all four scholarships, then the leadership at OCA can decide how to apply the remaining scholarships to students that they want to see remain in their school as spiritual leaders. And so if, you're, if you have children and it's on your heart that you may want to enroll them into a school that is committed to kingdom education, please talk to me. Or when Eric gets here, he starts on June 28th. You can talk to him. Uh, but also, if you don't have any kids, uh, they're, they're grown. Um, you can still help. Uh, you can volunteer to be a tutor. You can get onto the list to be a substitute teacher. Uh, you can also teach a class. Uh, right now, it's a very small uh, school with a small staff. We really don't have the teachers to teach a lot of electives, but if we had people that are retired that have a skill and you want to teach a one-semester class that's an elective, that's certainly a possibility as well. And we have work days, just like the work day we had here and spread mulch. We spread the same kind of mulch over at OCA. <laughs> so you're, you're welcome to help us there as well. And then also building maintenance. Uh, you just need outlets replaced, uh, door stops replaced, hinges, whatever. There's all kinds of things that we build a list. If uh, you'd like to spend a day over there working on uh, just some of those maintenance items, you can talk to me as well. And lastly, you can become an OCA benefactor. You can help invest in this Christian school, the only accredited Christian school in the county. And we pull from multiple counties as far as Toccoa, Georgia. Uh, so that's where OCA is. We're, we're seeing a lot of students shadowing now, uh, getting ready for next year. And we're hoping the enrollment gets up uh, uh, close to 140 for next year. Um, and what's funny is those kids shadow now uh, in anticipation of enrolling them for next year. And what they tell their parents and grandparents after they shadow is, can I come back tomorrow and start tomorrow? Because uh, they're so excited and they love the environment over at OCA. Uh, so that's where we are today. So if you have any questions for me, uh, please feel free to ask me after the service. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. And again, a ministry we're uh, really thankful for and just have had a great uh, relationship with uh, over, the, over the years. And so as a church, we're always um, concerned for the, for the youth and, and children and how God is, is working among them. And so thankful for, for this ministry and all that it does and pouring out uh, to them. But uh, let's, let's come to the Lord in prayer, praying for OCA and just praying for, for God's work uh, throughout our, our community. Would you pray with me? Oh, Lord, our God, you are an amazing uh, amazing God, amazing King, Lord over all, that you are Savior, that you are our Father, our Shepherd, and our Guide, uh, that all things uh, point to your glory. Uh, Lord, how thankful we are then to live uh, in your world, to see uh, creation, to see your, uh, your power and your majesty uh, displayed in the beauty of your creation, uh, to look at the history of all that you have uh, done throughout uh, from beginning creation, upholding the world and all the ways that you have uh, worked among your people and worked in history, uh, pointing things uh, toward their, their fullness and end, the consummation of all things in Christ. And then in the fullness of time that you sent forth your son uh, into the world, born of a woman, uh, under the law, uh, that we might have salvation in his name. Oh Lord, you are our glorious and we delight to be able to praise your name, to come uh, before you. As we come before you, we also come uh, admitting our failures, admitting our, our sins against you, the offenses that, that come uh, up to you, even the things that we uh, don't realize as much. Uh, Lord, but we so easily take lightly uh, your word, your commands, uh, the glory of your character and what you uh, call us to be as your people. Lord, we know that, that you are aware of all those offenses, and we acknowledge that we don't want to hide uh, from you or from ourselves uh, how 
much and how deeply we need you because your grace is fully sufficient to cover all of our sins. So, Lord, we acknowledge before you even just how much our life is so often shaped around pursuing our own pleasures, uh, pursuing things that, that build us up or seeking out our own interest uh, more than seeking your glory and finding ourselves in you, uh, seeking ourselves more than, than loving and serving our neighbor as you tell us to love our neighbor as ourselves. Uh, but, Lord, you also... Uh, Tell us that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, as that unrighteousness uh, seeps out through us, we pray that you would cleanse us from all of it, that we would be uh, washed clean, that we would know your forgiveness, your delight in us, uh, because Jesus has taken the fullness of that blame, that there remains no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so, Lord, let us live then in your love and with a desire to serve you. Fill us with your spirit uh, that we might live as you call us to live, that you might bring your word to mind, uh, that it might shape how we live, that you might work in us more and more uh, the character of Christ who is our Lord and Savior. And, Lord, we lift up to you uh, our needs and, and pray for the various ways that you are working within the world for the glory of your name. And, Lord, we particularly lift up... uh, Uh, Oconee Christian Academy, we thank you for uh, the years of faithfulness in their work, uh, how you have used them, how you have uh, uh, grown and developed uh, this school, and how many uh, lives and hearts it has impacted. Lord, we pray uh, for the administration and the teachers there and how much they uh, give of themselves and sacrifice of themselves uh, for the children. We pray for the youth there, uh, Lord, that you would set their hearts upon you. Uh, Lord, that they might, uh, we pray for them, we pray for, for all the youth in our, in our church and in our community, uh, that it might be your word uh, that shapes their perspective, that it might be your word uh, that guides their hearts, it might be your word uh, that leads them on as you grow and develop them. Lord, we pray for uh, the generations that you are raising up, that they would not be a generation that doesn't know you. Uh, but that calls on your name, that quickly uh, turns back to you. Uh, Lord, both at OCA and and those who are homeschooled and those in the various public schools or other options, Lord, we pray that you would work among them, that you would raise up uh, leaders for yourself among them, that you would uh, lead them in in serving you as you develop and grow their faith. And Lord, we pray uh, similar things for all of us, that you would quickly, uh, continually turn our hearts back to you, not allow us to go our, our own ways, uh, Lord, but to, but to seek you out, to find you, uh, to be changed by you. Lord, we pray that you would use us uh, for your mission in the world. Uh, be that among our, our family, our, our neighborhood, our coworkers, friends, relatives. Uh, Lord, use us as, as a reflection of Christ. Would you put the character of Christ in, in us and allow others to, to see and know him through our actions and through our words as well. Uh, Lord, not for our glory, but that you would be uh, glorified in it. And Lord, we lift up the, uh, the needs of, of our body. Lord, we, uh, we thank you for the, for the Gwens and for this new, uh, new life uh, that you have given them. We pray that you would uh, give them uh, joy in that, that you would bless them. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would put your, your blessing on, on their child and that you would uh, um, sanctify their family uh, in this and allow us to come around them as well. Lord, we also bring uh, before you, we know there's some who are recovering from surgery, some who are uh, dealing uh, regularly with a number of pains and difficulties, and we pray that you would heal, uh, that you would sustain, that you would enrich their faith, enrich all of our faith, even through the trials through which you uh, bring us. Uh, But Lord, that in all those things we might uh, look to you, we might see your name uh, glorified and lifted up uh, in us and through us. Lord, what an amazing thing it is that you, our God, have come and and served us uh, in the person of Christ, that we might know you and have life in your name. So, Lord, we pray that you would help us to live as your servants. We pray in Jesus. Amen. special this is a song I wanted to do a couple of weeks ago when David was preaching about community because it fits in there but it also fits really really perfectly with today's 
topic on service because it's only within a community uh, that you can actually serve. And the, the reference is to uh, the passage in John 13 where Jesus himself um, humbles himself even further than what we can even understand uh, to wash the feet of the disciples. Um, it's a difficult thing to serve because you have to be vulnerable to enter into somebody's life and to receive that service. You have to be vulnerable and humble in order to receive it, and that's always difficult, both parts. So um, let this be an encouragement that we too can be as our Savior Christ. And the call is to community. There's a room, a parable is just about to come alive. And while they bicker about who's best, with a painful glance, he'll silently rise. Their Savior servant must show them how, through the will of the water and the tenderness of the time and the call is to community the impoverished power that sets the soul free the humility to take the vow and day after day we must take up the basin and the time David and Leslie and Tom, great, great song, great ministry. Before we look at the word this morning, would you pray with me? Let's just ask God's blessing.
Father, we are grateful for your word and grateful that you have preserved it for us down through the ages. And we're grateful that the Spirit of God continues to apply to our hearts and lives in such a way as to transform us into the likeness of Jesus. And Father, we pray that as we approach your word today, uh, Lord, you would remove distractions, that you would remove anything from our hearts that would really keep us from hearing what you're saying to us. Pray that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see. I pray that the words of my mouth and all the meditations of our heart would be pleasing and acceptable to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, today we're going to finish up our mini series that we've been on, looking at the core values of our church here. These are the values that really undergird everything that we do here. Uh, but they're also the values that. Uh, form a bedrock for the individual believer. Uh, it gives you a foundation for really growing as a true disciple of Jesus Christ. And that's what we're all about. Uh, that's our motto, growing true disciples. We want you to, uh, to grow in your knowledge of Jesus, your love for him, your obedience to him, your trust in him. And uh, so as to become more and more like Jesus, to experience more of his reality in our daily lives. And so uh, we're going to be finishing up on these core values. And next week, we're actually going to be uh, begin going through uh, the book of 1 Peter. We're going to walk through that, and uh, so we'll get back into another book today. But so far, as we've looked at the core values, we've talked about mission. Our mission uh, begins right here where we are. Uh, this is our Jerusalem, where we're to be his witnesses, but we're not to limit ourselves just to this place. God, uh, God's heart is to have a people from every tribe and nation. Uh, God wants us to have that heart. He wants us to collaborate with him. And there are two ways that we can do that. Either we can go and tell people face-to-face -face, uh, the gospel. Uh, we can go like Tony and Kendall have gone and uh, there to tell people. Or we can help send people. We can help send people. And that's why we have this faith promise. Uh, this is our commitment to send people out. Now, I, w I want to remind you as well, even as we talk about faith promise, that you know we're at 70,000 at this point, and that's great. That's a lot of money, isn't it? But did you know how many giving units have uh, contributed that? It's 22. So about a quarter of our congregation has participated in at this point. So I want to encourage you all uh, to get on board with this. This is who we are. This is what God has called us to do is to send people out into the world. Well, we also talked about worship. Now, worship is basically our response to God's revelation of himself. Uh, God has revealed himself to us so that we can adore him, we can uh, just uh, praise him and give thanks, and we can submit to his will to us, uh, for us. And so worship is at the very heart of who we are. We talked about community. Now, when God calls someone to himself, he and puts us in a community of believers. We're adopted into his family. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. And it's in the environment. What? Oh, you know, it would help if I put it on my ear. It was on, but it just went on my ear. Okay, let me start over. No. <laughs> Sorry, folks, uh, those who are watching, and I uh, hope you're good lip readers. So, uh, okay, where am I? Uh, so we talked about community, and that is the environment in which uh, we are to grow and nurture us spiritually so we can become the people God wants us to be. And then we talked about Scripture. I talked about Scripture last week. The importance of Scripture, how important it is that we not only know the Scripture, but we meditate on it, that we mull over it so that it's assimilated into our life and that we are doers of the word and not hearers only. It's, uh, it's so easy to just to hear and to think that's it. But as we meditate on the word, it transforms us from within. It becomes a part of who we are. Now today what we're going to talk about is service. Uh, this is the last of our core values and this is so important. Um, uh, the Greek word for service is diakonos. Uh, 
Uh, is a word that's translated deacon in First Timothy 3. Uh, the deacons were, uh, it's an office of service there. Uh, you see that the first deacons uh, were uh, basically elected in Acts 6, the seven men, and those were presumably the first deacons, and they were there to take care of the widows and to wait on tables. Uh, but there's another way it's translated as well. In Ephesians 3 and Colossians 1, Paul talks about he's a minister of the gospel. He's a minister. Uh, so diakonos is also translated minister there. And, uh, and of course, when you hear the word minister, what do you think of? Well, typically, if someone were to ask you, who's the minister at your church? You'd say, well, Tom and David, they're the ministers there. Uh, we're the paid staff. But that's only part of the truth there. The reality is that every single person who is a believer in Christ, if God has brought you here to Crossgate, you are a minister. You're one of the ministers here. Uh, Crossgate will never achieve uh, the mission that God has given to us if just a couple of people are ministering. Every one of us are called to minister. So that's one takeaway I want you to uh, just kind of uh, put in your brain there. That God has called all of us to be ministers. This is a church of many ministers. Many ministers. But secondly, I want you to understand this as well. That it's going to be impossible for you to really grow as a true disciple of Christ if you're not ministering. A Christianity is not a spectator sport. A Christianity is not something where you come on Sunday and you watch the pastor and the worship team do their thing. And you, know, you get this good feeling and feel encouraged and comforted and so forth. Uh, you know, it's about collaborating with God. It's about being involved with Him. And so uh, that's critically important that we understand that. But there's a verse in Ephesians. In Ephesians 4, it says this, And He gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. I think the NIV there has the work of service. But service is ministry. A servant is a minister. And this is for the building up of the body of Christ. Now there are five things I want you to understand about service today. First of all, serving is an integral part of discipleship, providing each of us with a unique opportunity to be like Jesus. If you have your Bible, turn with me to John 13. This is the passage on which David's song was based. It's come to the close of Jesus' ministry. He's about to partake of the Passover with his uh, disciples for the very last time. And they go into this upper room. Uh, they've traveled there, and uh, their feet are all dusty. And as was common in that day, when you went into someone's home, there would be a basin there, there would be a pitcher, and there would be a towel. And guess what? There would also be a servant there, a slave there, uh, that would basically wash your feet. Uh, that was just how things were. That was customary in that day. Uh, look at the beginning of verse 1. It says, Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And during supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and they had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from supper and laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he girded himself. So here they were. Uh, they've gone into this upper room. They walked into the room and they saw the basin and the pitcher and the towel in the corner, but there wasn't a servant. There wasn't a slave. They, who was going to wash your feet? It, it was sort of like one of those things. That it, everyone recognized the problem. It was sort of the elephant in the room. But what were they going to do about it? How were they going to resolve this particular problem? Well, they decided that the best thing to do was just go ahead and I reclined at the table and prepared to eat. That's what they did. And so they're at the table there. They've got their dirty feet, dusty uh, from their travels and so forth, and uh, they're eating a meal together. And during the supper, Jesus got up 
And he took his, uh, basically laid aside his garment and took the towel, girded himself. And it says in verse 5, Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. So he's going around. You can just envision this. Picture what was going on here. He's going around to each of the disciples doing what a servant would do. And then you skip down to verse 12. It says this. So when he had washed their feet, and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Here they had followed Jesus for some three years. And, and here he is, the Lord, the teacher, the master, the rabbi. He's the one that's humbling himself, putting him in this lowly position, kneeling down before his disciples and washing their feet. And Jesus said, listen, if you're going to be my disciples, if you're going to become like me, which is what happens, a disciple becomes as his master, then you've got to learn to serve. You've got to learn to serve. During the American Revolution, the story is told about a man uh, on a horse that uh, was just in casual civilian clothes and so forth, and he was riding through an area where there was a defense uh, barrier that was being repaired. Uh, there were a number of soldiers who were working on it, and there was an officer there who was barking out orders and telling these men what they need to be doing, but he wouldn't lift a finger to help. And so this gentleman on the horse came by, and he said, Sir, why are you not helping these men? His response was, Sir, I am a corporal. And so uh, the man on the horse got down off his high horse. And uh, I don't know where that came from. But he got down and uh, he, he began to help these men. He began to help these men repair the uh, defense position and so forth. And after they had finished the work, he got back on on those horse and he said Mr. Corporal he says the next time you have a job to do and you don't have enough men uh, to help with the work uh, go to your commander in chief and I will come and help you again it was George Washington on the horse well we don't expect someone in a high position necessarily to, to act that way to act as a servant but that's what we see throughout the life of Jesus and we'll talk about that again a little more in a minute. But so that's the first thing. Servanthood provides us an opportunity to be like Jesus. And isn't that what we all want? We want to be like Jesus. That's why we're here today. We want more of his life to just fill us and overflow through us. A second thing we see here, and it's related to this, serving is one way that we cultivate the virtue of humility. Now, in his J.I. Packer's book, Rediscovering Holiness, he says this, The focus of health in the soul is humility, while the root of the inward corruption is pride. In the spiritual life, nothing stands still. If we are not constantly growing downward into humility, we shall be steadily swelling up and running to sea under the influence of pride. That's quite a statement, isn't it? We're growing downward into humility. And you say, well, how do you become humble? How do you grow in humility? Well, Richard Foster in his book, Celebration of Discipline, says this. More than any other single way, the grace of humility is worked into our lives through the discipline of service. When we set out on a consciously chosen course of action, that accents the good of others and is for the most part a hidden work, a deep change occurs in our spirit. And he goes on to talk about hidden service. And in this what he says, nothing disciplines the inordinate desires of the flesh like service. And nothing transforms the desires of the flesh like serving in hiddenness. The flesh whines against service. 
but screams against hidden servants. How often we don't mind serving as long as someone knows we're serving and appreciates what we're doing. Hidden service is not something we particularly like. And, and it's true, our flesh does scream against that. I mean, if we're going to serve, we want people to know we're serving and how well we're doing it. Uh, that's the pride. That's the pride that all of us struggle with. All of us struggle with pride because we want to be respected. We want to be well thought of. We want people to look up to us. We want people to think we're wonderful people. We want our egos stroked. That's the thing we're constantly dealing with. So God says, listen, you grow in humility by learning to serve. And serving in hiddenness is even better. And Foster goes on to say this, hiddenness is a rebuke to the flesh and can deal a death blow to pride. If we're going to grow in Christ's likeness, we're going to emulate our Savior, then it's very important that we grow in humility, that we grow downward into humility. Well, there's a third thing we learn. Serving is a means by which we reflect the values of the kingdom of God. In in Matthew 20, if you have your Bible, you can turn there with me. It's a story that's probably familiar to a lot of you. It's when James and John came to Jesus with their mother, and the mother makes this request of Jesus. Uh, beginning in verse 20 of chapter 20 of Matthew, says, Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus with her sons, bowing down and making a request of him. And he said to her, What do you wish? She said to him, Command that in your kingdom these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right and one on your left. But Jesus answered, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? They said to him, we are able. Now you notice it's not just the mother that's making this request. Uh, It's not the disciples or didn't know what their mom was up to. It's all of them. In fact, one of the other uh, parallel passages, one of the Gospels makes it very clear that James and John were all on board with them. And even as Jesus addresses them, you do not know what you're asking. That is the plural. Uh, That's the plural form of you. In the Greek, there's a singular and plural. This is plural, so he's addressing mom and son. And they said to him, we are able. He said to them, my cup you shall drink, but to sit on my right and on my left, this is not mine to give, but it's for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. And hearing this, the ten became indignant with the two brothers. I wonder why. Why were they so offended? Uh, that this request had come to Jesus. Well, I think it's pretty obvious. Those were the positions they wanted. Uh, Those were the positions they were jockeying for. This is what they wanted. And James and John beat them to the draw. How dare they? And yet you see the pride here. You see the pride that all of the disciples are struggling with at this point. They want to be great. Uh, So Jesus goes on in verse 25 and says this, He called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. How do you become great? Well, the world would say that if you want to be great, uh, you need to accomplish something of significance. You need to acquire a lot of money. You need the titles. You need the respect. You need all of these things. And Jesus says, listen, in the kingdom of God, the values are really turned upside down, turned on their head here. Uh, what is great in the world's view is not viewed as great in the eyes of God. The way to be great with God is simply to become servant. I become a lowly servant. And then God looks at you and says, man, that's great. Uh, A story is told about a, you may have heard the story about a man, a very wealthy man who wanted to take his wealth to heaven. And uh, 
And he pleaded with God day after day, Lord, let me take some of my wealth to heaven. Finally, God relented. That is obviously not a true story, okay? In case you're wondering. Um, God relented and said, okay, but only one suitcase. Only one suitcase. So the day came where this man was taken to heaven, and he had a suitcase, and he met St. Peter at the gates of heaven, and, and uh, St. Peter said, well, you're welcome to come in, but you can't bring that. You can't bring in the suitcase. And, and the man said, well, listen, I've already talked with God. It's been arranged. He said I could bring this suitcase. And St. Peter said, let me take a look at it. And by the way, what he decided to take, this rich man of all his wealth, he wanted gold bullion. He had gold bars. That's what he wanted to take. So St. Peter opens the suitcase and looks and says, what are you bringing pavement for? <laughs> At the point being, the point is obvious. What we put so much value on today, it's just nothing in the eyes of God. And, and so it raises the question, by whose values are we living today? Are we embracing the values of the world or the values of the kingdom of God? Are we living by those values? And is this one of the reasons why perhaps non-Christians aren't drawn to believers more? It's because what they see in our lives are values that they're well acquainted with because of the values of the world. We need to understand that God calls us as children of the kingdom, as servants of the kingdom, to live by his values. And being a servant and being a slave to others is part of this. Well, four things. Serving is one way that we show ourselves to be faithful stewards. You know what a steward is? It's someone who simply manages the, the household and manages the affairs of another person. Uh, literally, the Greek word comes from a, a base word, oikos, which means... Uh, it means home or house, and, and then nomos, uh, that means to arrange or manage. We get our English word economy uh, from this word. The economy is managing the income and expenditures of a household or a government or whatever. And so we're called to be stewards. Now, most of us, when we hear the word steward, we immediately think of stewardship Sunday, finances, and so forth. But it's far more than that. Uh, look at 1 Peter 4.10. It says, As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the multifaceted grace of God. In other words, all of us are stewards. All of us are stewards. And we're stewards of God's grace. These are the resources that God has blessed us with. In particular, what he's talking about here are gifts that God has given to us. These are special gifts. The word there is charismata. Uh, we get our uh, charismatic from that. But charis means grace. A gift, spiritual gift, is simply a gift of grace. Paul writes this in Romans 12, However, since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to use them properly. So God has equipped every single person who is a believer with a gift or a set of gifts and so forth. That he says, I want you to use these gifts to build up the body of Christ. I want you to use these gifts to encourage other believers, to make the church stronger. Now we have a choice. We can either be a good steward... We can be a bad steward, but you know what Matthew 25 tells us in the parable of the talents. I remember where uh, servants were given ten talents, five talents, one talent. And the one talent person, he went and hid his talent. He didn't invest it. He didn't invest it so as to make a profit for the Lord. And all of them were called to account. One day all of us will be called to account. And God will say to you, what you do with the grace that I gave to you? I gave you grace so that you could serve, so that you had a special ability to use your gifts to build up the body of Jesus. What you do with it? Are we going to come up with excuses? Well, Lord, I was so busy. I mean, things were so hectic and, and busy in our house, at work, and so forth. I was going here and there and doing this and that. The one talent survey came up with, the, with his excuses. 
but God didn't bite. And God ended up casting him out. He was a worthless slave. God wants us to be good stewards. Good stewards. And it's by our serving one another that the body of Christ is built up. I I might add this as well. If, in fact, we're not serving, we're not going to grow spiritually. In fact, what you're going to find if you're not serving, then you're going to be spiraling downward spiritually. Uh, There was a 20th century Spanish philosopher, forget his name, Unamuno, Unamuno, 20th century. And uh, he, he talks about an ancient Roman aqueduct uh, that was built in 109 A.D. It carried down water from the mountains into the city of Segovia in Spain. And it did th- had done this for 1,800 years. 1,800 years, almost 60 generations of people had been blessed by the water that came down of this ancient aqueduct. But then uh, there was a generation that rose and they decided that, you know, this aqueduct is so important. We want our children to be able to see this aqueduct. We want them to uh, be able to enjoy it. And so it's sort of like we want to put it in a museum, make it like a museum. And so what they decided to do is this. They would put modern iron pipe down into the city and the water could run through that so the aqueduct wouldn't have to be used anymore and it could just be marveled at and people could look at it. Well, you know what happened? Since there was no water on it, the mortar began to dry up and become brittle under the hot sun. Uh, The rocks and and so forth began to deteriorate, began to sink a little bit. And see, being useless, as long as the water was flowing, as long as it was serving a purpose, for 1,800 years, it, it was viable, it was being used. But then when it became basically just... Uh, stale, not being used, it began to dry up and deteriorate. I think that happens to believers as well. As long as God's grace is flowing through us, uh, then we're going to grow. God's going to be using us. If you become a, a dam rather than a channel, and you're just storing up the blessings of God, a dam water, damned water, you get that right, it, it tends to it, it tends to uh, just become stale, and moss grows, and so forth. It's not going to be fresh. And so God wants us to be good stewards, so his grace is flowing through us. J.I. Packer said this, When the New Testament speaks of ministering to the saints, it means not primarily preaching to them, but devoting time, trouble, and substance to giving them all the practical help possible. The essence of Christian service is loyalty to the king expressing itself in care for his servants. Loyalty to the king, care for his servants. Well, the last thing here about serving. It is the way that we fulfill our mission. Serving and mission go hand in hand. Remember again in Matthew 20, it said this, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Throughout the course of Jesus' earthly ministry, I mean, we see he was constantly serving. Constantly serving. He was feeding people. He was healing people. He was casting out demons. He He was constantly doing things for people, meeting their felt needs. And of course, ultimately... The ultimate service was offering itself up as a sacrifice for our sins so that people could be ransomed, so they could be set free from their bondage to Satan. Well, God calls us to serve in that way as well. He says, I want you to serve, but I want you to give your life, and this is what serving is all about, is giving your life away. It's basically pushing aside your agenda uh, your desires and your wants and, and your needs even so that you can help others. 
And what happens is this, as we serve people in that way, guess what, it opens up doors for us to talk about people's perhaps unfelt need, talk about the greatest need they have, and that is to be forgiven their sins, uh, to be set free from their bondage. That's what God wants us to do. Give our life away so that others could be set free. And that doesn't just happen as we go out and say, okay, I'm going to evangelize someone. If you're looking for doors to share the gospel, the door, the thing that opens up these doors for sharing the gospel is service. So, serving, just sort of review. It gives us a unique opportunity to be like Jesus. To follow in his steps. What a blessing that is. Secondly, it's a way we cultivate the virtue of humility. Which is what all of us need. It's a means by which we reflect the values of the kingdom of God. We are part of a kingdom. We're, we're strangers and aliens in this world. We're part of his kingdom. We need to live like that. Fourthly, we show ourselves to be faithful stewards. And then finally, it is the way that we fulfill our mission. Dawson Trotman was the founder of an organization a lot of you are familiar with called The Navigators. Uh, his uh, ministry has been around for some time and having a great impact. But Dawson Trotman at one point had gone to Taiwan to minister to some of the uh, ministers over there, the preachers, and... Uh, he was with one uh, Taiwan pastor, and he was going out into the little mountain villages to minister to them. And so as they were traveling along the road and on the trails, uh, it was rainy, it was wet. Their feet got extremely muddy and so forth. And one man once asked uh, this uh, Taiwanese pastor, he said, what do you remember most about Dawson Trotman? And his response was this. He cleaned my shoes. He cleaned my shoes. He got up the next morning and Dawson had beat him up, gotten up earlier, and he cleaned the mud off his pastor's shoes. That's what really struck him. Uh, Dawson Trotman was a true disciple of Jesus, a true servant. In fact, he died in the same way he lived. He died at the age of 50 by rescuing a young woman who was drowning. He gave his life so that she could live. Are we willing to serve? Do you understand that I'm not the minister and David is not the minister of Crossgate? We are the ministers at Crossgate. We are the ministers. Next time someone asks you who the pastor is, see what they do, and you say, well, I'm one of them. What a great privilege. What a great privilege. But this is how uh, the church is able to move forward and accomplish the work that God has called us to do. Let's grow down, downward, into humility. Let's ask God to make us truly humble, to live by His values, the values of the kingdom, so that we can accomplish the work He's given to us. Let's pray. Our Father, we're so amazed at the, at the fact that Jesus came here as a servant took on flesh and blood and became like us so that he could serve us. Oh, Father, I pray that you would help us to grow as servants. I, I know that our flesh in each of us rails against that. Lord, we don't like to serve. I know I don't because I've got other things on my 
agenda, things I need to do, and and it's so hard to sacrifice time and to help others. But Lord, I thank you for the privilege we have of serving others in the body. I thank you for so many folks in this church who are true servants, reflect the values of your kingdom. Uh, Lord, I pray that all of us would grow downward into humility so that we could be used of you as channels of your grace. Uh, Lord, thank you for loving us so much. Thank you for the community of believers. Thank you that we get to help each other and we need each other to grow as true disciples. Lord, we give you thanks for all of this and what you're doing in our lives now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So please stand. We close with a familiar tune. Maybe a little different words, but it calls us to that notion, uh, opportunity to serve. Before you can be a channel of God's grace, you have to experience God's grace in your life. And that first initial experience of God's grace comes when you recognize your sin and you repent of your sin and put your trust in Jesus. And so if you're here today and you've never made that commitment to Jesus, I'd love to talk with you and love to invite you to come to the Savior, come to the cross, so you can experience that grace in your life and then you can become a channel of that grace. Receive God's benediction. Now may the God of peace that brought up from the grave, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and evermore. Amen.